I guess a good place to start is, um, you know, what, what does make for a successful startup? We, we hear a lot of conventional wisdom, wise sayings uh, like this, diligence is the mother of good luck, uh, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, uh, which suggests that if you just work really hard, you're going to succeed. Uh, but unfortunately, I think we've all probably met people that have worked really well, uh, re really hard, they've been very diligent in their approach, and yet they've uh, failed. And conversely, we've also met people that were negligent and succeeded. So that doesn't entirely answer the question. There's obviously more to it uh, than just simply working hard. With the startup, you're not just dealing with one dynamic. You're not just simply looking at, let's say, building a great product. You've got, you know, this is, this is what we ultimately will talk about later, but six different dynamics uh, all at work. Uh, defining the, 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 the fluid uh, dynamic market that you're about to enter. And so if you simply look at that one aspect, you're going to be at a, um, a disadvantage. And so that's really what leads into this conversation, which is about product strategy for startups. How can you be more strategic in your approach and increase your odds for succeeding? So the first criteria uh, is the, the customer. Uh, at the end of the day, I mean, what, what, what are we really trying to accomplish when we start a business? Um, I would argue if we're doing it properly, we're starting with, with an unmet need or desire. We're looking for a customer that has a pain point, maybe not even a pain point, but maybe it's just a desire, something that they want that isn't being satisfied by the market. So again, helping others, right? This sounds cheesy, but after thinking about this obsessively, this is ultimately what I've come down to. What my mom told me was right. Just help other people, focus on that, right? And, and the reason is, if, if you focus purely on, on, on making money, extracting value from the market, uh, what's gonna happen? You're gonna end up focusing on opportunities that might already be mature. Where's the money at? A lot of times, when you start looking for that, you're going to see, you're going to identify the mature markets, places that the money's already been made, they're already sophisticated competitors in the marketplace. That's not necessarily where the best opportunities are for a young startup to come in. If you're focusing instead on, on helping people, though, solving their problems, you're going to um, more naturally identify those unmet needs. And so simply focusing on helping others can be a great place to start. Right size market. So I, I take an agnostic uh, position on this one. Um, big market or small market. This, this has a lot to do with your own um, uh, resources, really. I mean, if you're, if you're looking at going into a very competitive market, you want to create a new you know, uh, social app, you want to do a, uh, a chat app, for example, right? Well, that's going to require a lot of resources. The market is so competitive at this point. You can't go in and, and seriously try to do that unless you've got serious capital to, to insert yourself into that market. Conversely, though, if you go after too small of a market, too much of a niche, there might not be enough opportunity to justify the effort that you're expending. This is something I wonder about uh, you know, in the field of product management, for example. Is that a big enough market uh, that, that there's a, a solution uh, that, that is justified? So, so really, it comes down to identifying the right size market for your, um, for your own needs and for your own uh, resources. Reliable access to customers. There are plenty of businesses, I'm sure we all know a few, who've been hit pretty hard by Google recently, um, particularly kind of lead gen type of businesses that uh, relied heavily upon organic search traffic. Uh, with with uh, the Google and the Panda updates recently, um, it's made uh, life pretty difficult for some businesses. And if they have been relying solely upon uh, Google organic traffic as their sole source of traffic, uh, if that was their, their, their primary channel, uh, that made things a lot worse. Uh, similarly, I mean, if you were, if you were an, uh, a Facebook platform app game developer a few years ago, you would have been hit pretty hard by uh, the changes in that platform, which de-emphasized apps on the, on the Facebook platform. And so the point here is, you know, it, all of these uh, channels can be great, especially things like organic traffic, uh, because they're, you know, arguably free if you set aside the amount of time that you're spending to get there. But if you rely upon them solely, um, that's a, what we call in engineering, a single point of failure. You, you, you wouldn't want to do that. You, you don't want to leave a single place where the entire business can fall apart. And so, so it's good to have diversified channels, diversified access to customers, and not rely upon a single uh, thing to always be true to allow your business to continue to be viable. Product criteria. So arguably a product is a response to that customer need or desire. And so what makes for a good product? First and foremost, it needs to reply, respond to the customer, uh, customer's need or desire. Uh, you should have low barriers to entry, uh, adoption, <laughs> not entry, and clear value proposition. So it turns out, I, I was researching this, looking for great images. It turns out this is uh, a, a picture from, uh, uh, from Zen philosophy um, th th that are, uh, basically uh, visualizes the idea of simplicity and focus. I, I like that metaphor because really, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're focused on solving a problem, um, how the best way you could possibly be relevant to solving that problem, I think, is to be focused entirely on that problem and, and to remove all of the uh, complexities that are going to obfuscate what you're trying to accomplish. 
So if you can stay simple, focused, that's the best way to solve that problem. I love this quote, again. Any intelligent fool can make things bigger and more complex. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. Low barriers to adoption. So when you're considering this product you're going to develop, um, one key criteria is making sure that this is something that is, that is actually adoptable. People are actually going to start using it. Things that might prevent them from starting to use it is if they are already significantly invested in a substitutable product, there's something they're already using that is similar to what you're now providing, but they've already invested a ton of time and money into that existing solution, they're probably too invested to consider your, your solution unless it's not comparable, unless it's non-substitutable. A learning curve. If your idea or your solution is too, uh, too complex, there's going to be pain in adoption again because you're going to have to spend a lot of time or a lot of money training to get up to speed. And workflow integration. If they are already using another platform, let's say that your idea is to create a, um, I don't know, a roadmap planning piece of software for, um, uh, for software development process. Um, that would be great, but what if the company already uses Jira? Uh, Jira? Uh, you don't want to try to replace Jira. You probably want to integrate into it. And so if you provide those integration points, that would reduce uh, barriers to adoption. And finally, clear value proposition. Uh, I've spoken to people before that have great ideas, but they're very complex. And no matter how much they try to distill that, that, that uh, value proposition of why somebody should care or use their product, they can't get it down to less than three or four sentences. It's just too, uh, too abstract, too complicated. The goal should be to get it down to a single sentence or two. If you can't do that, there's a problem. Um, and for that matter, too, making sure that you're, you're focusing on the right uh, thing, making sure you're focusing on the, the solving the problem, not the technology that solves the problem. Uh, again, a great quote. People don't want quarter-inch quarter drills. They want quarter-inch holes. Uh, this is a problem, arguably, Apple solved uh, beautifully with the iPod. Um, rather than focusing on, uh, you know, sample rates and, and size of hard drive and whatnot. They focused on a thousand songs in your pocket. That was the value uh, proposition to the consumer that was extremely clear and, and told what problem they were solving. Uh, some of the things we can look for to determine if it's good uh, timing or not is, uh, has there been a recent innovation enabler? Uh, is demand already established? Are you too early? Are there signs of commoditization? Are you too late? Uh, this is a little bit washed out, but this is Rogers. Uh, Everett Rogers in 1962 introduced the idea of the innovation adoption curve. Uh, this curve represents the volume of people that are entering the market. And so you can see early on, it's a very small number of people. It gradually grows, and then by the time you hit early majority, it explodes. And then by the time you hit late majority, there are still people entering the market, but the quantity of people entering now is starting to go down. Later, uh, Jeffrey Moore introduced the idea of a chasm uh, in his book, Crossing the Chasm. He said the ideal place to enter market is right there. The idea is that if you enter too early again, you're going to be um, at a disadvantage because you might end up chasing ideas that are not uh, validated yet. Um, we've all heard examples of people that spend a lot of time building up a great platform to solve a problem that ultimately people didn't care about. So you want to make sure you, you wait long enough that you can, in fact, see that there is demand for this. Um, but at the same time, you want to make sure that you enter early enough that you're able to ramp up and be able to compete uh, when, when the market starts to get a little bit dense. There's arguably a capitulation point um, at the very top of this peak here. This is where the number of competitors uh, supply is going to exceed demand. And so you want to make sure that you enter here at the chasm so that you have enough time to ramp up by the time you get to the capitulation point. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get scale and be able to compete against the, uh, the, uh, the other competitors that are going to uh, reach efficiencies of, uh, of scale. So an interesting dynamic in timing, especially when you're talking about technology, is the commoditization of the technology itself. Another great quote, Nicholas Carr uh, wrote in the Harvard Business Review that it is difficult to imagine a more perfect commodity than a byte of data. Uh, as information technology's power and ubiquity have grown, its strategic importance has diminished. So in other words, if you're the first person that has that technology, fantastic, you've got a competitive advantage. But technology has this nasty habit of commoditizing, becoming really uh, inexpensive and really commonplace, at which point it's no longer a strategic advantage. And that leads into competition, which I think Sonia's going to talk about next. So even if you have developed, created a great product that meets the customer needs, that you know that for sure has market fit, at the right time you push out to the market, doesn't mean that you're going to succeed. Because you're going to have to strategically break through a huge amount of internet competition. And so the goal here is to make the competition irrelevant. In an efficient market, usually a big player or a few key players, they will take the whole value of the market. 
So you're not trying to focus on those kind of market because they're already been conquered and grabbed. So what you're trying to look for is opportunities in either new market or fragmented market or stagnant market. So take new market for example. Maybe you shouldn't try to look for uh, creating another awesome social network and to beat uh, Facebook. So maybe instead you should look into new uh, hot market that's coming up such as wearable technologies or internet TV. Low barrier to entry. So don't fight a war that you cannot win. A Chinese philosopher Sun Tzu in his famous book The Art of War says this, um, he who know, the general knows when he can fight and when he cannot will be victorious. So sometimes step back from a busy, um, comp highly competitive market is also a smart move. So to keep a, a financial fit is very important, not just to your potential investors, but also to yourself. How do you make your employee and staff be confident about the business you're developing? So that includes uh, keeping the sunk cost low at upfront and also reserve a working capital fund and uh, keep going to uh, keep making your profit going up uh, by the economy of scale. So low sunk cost. So we mentioned uh, in a product uh, model before, you're gonna need a upfront cost to build that product, to uh, initiate that marketing campaign upfront, and some costs are not inevitable. So what you're trying to do is to try to keep the low sum cost loss and there's a strategy such as lean development. So when you go into the product development, you're trying to create that MVP, the minimal viable product, and push out to the market to see the market fit and then more, then you build on each version, each edition, you add more features gradually, not just hoping to reach a most robust uh, product using the most uh, best uh, architecture, uh, the most update framework. Uh, that's not the goal. Working capital flow. So it's very common for startup kind of business to uh, sometimes to three or four months of uh, payment not received from your uh, major clients or customer. So as a founder, sure enough, you can sleep in your car for a couple of months, you don't mind, but your employee probably will leave very soon. So what you, uh, in practice, ideally what you want to do is to reserve uh, either cash, uh, cash or credit-based three to four months kind of operating, uh, operation cost so that you can uh, go over that kind of difficult times. So ideally, your team will uh, have one hacker and one hustler. So the hacker will be um, the engineer that owning the uh, technology uh, skills and knowledge and he can go out there and design and develop good quality product. And the hustler on the other side is supposed to be the business person who has his knowledge in, uh, your, about your customer, about your market, and he can go ahead and go out and sell and also market and also uh, network with people.